So you would like to get a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship, both maybe because it will look really good on your CV and also maybe because the salary won't make you regret the fact that you are actually a scientist. Anyway, last year I was awarded a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship, so today I'm going to share with you some tips and tricks to actually get one. And very quickly, it actually doesn't require you to have some impressive stats, actually if you have them that's super great, but you don't need to have like tons of publications and citation, even just standard metrics are perfectly good. But as we will see, there is actually a ton of work, a lot of things to know, and actually it's really require a lot of effort for you to put it into this application. Very quickly about this channel, this channel is about social complexity, probably you don't care at all, but we have some information, let me put my laser pointer, some information about social complexity with some videos which are just for the general public and some other videos which are way more technical. And definitely we have some videos like this which are actually for all the researchers and we share some tools and knowledge for improving our career. Also, very quickly, let me share something about my story, mostly because it will become relevant later as I will speak about this, uh, my application. Uh, so I have a really scattered background. Actually, I have also a video about this if you're interested. But I was able to jump from quantum cryptography to microfluidics to biophotonics and even now uh, I'm actually working in modeling human behavior, which is actually the purpose of my Marie Curie Fellowship. And as I was saying, actually my stats at the time of the application for the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship were actually not that impressive, they were quite average. I have published only three papers as first author, uh, the impact factor of the journal was slightly above two, I had one, uh, 21 citation and my age value was actually three. So pretty average, nothing outstanding. So the good news is that actually the Marie Curie Fellowship doesn't require you to have some amazing stats. Still, only 10, 15% of the applicants are actually able to pass through and to get actually the funding. So as you might understand, there should be a trick somewhere because if you can be average, but then only 10% of people can get in. There should be some trick somewhere. And the trick actually is that, unfortunately, this application requires a lot of work. Also because it's not like many other applications and you really need to think in such a way that then you will get it. You will communicate in the right way, in the way that is interesting for them and so then you can get a lot of points scoring the top 10% and then get the fundings. So the number of tips and tricks are almost limitless. Here I will share only three, which might sound really weird the first time because it's going to be the right mindsets, the right project and the right person. And you might think like, well, actually I already have the project and I'm pretty sure I know which person should be, but don't worry, I will explain this in a moment. So just let's jump into it. A very quick disclaimer, of course, every person works differently. So I'm going to share actually what worked really well for me. Probably it's going to work really well also for you, but don't apply it exactly in the same way. So try to start similar to me and then try to tune it in a way which is the best for you. So maybe something is not going to work perfectly, you will need to tune some things, you will figure it out. But I think this is going to be a very good starting point. And actually I know because I already talked to several people and uh, they seem to appreciate this. So let's start with the right mindset. And uh, very quickly, you will have pretty much to use two mindsets. I know a lot of people only try to push the positive mindset, but trust me, you will also need very strongly a negative mindset, even if it might sound counterintuitive. And this is going to be because actually your work uh, will be very long and 
probably you will have to go through different phases. So in some phases you will write your proposal and then you will have to highlight all the problem and the defects and then uh, and this would be in the negative phase and then you will have to rewrite it uh, several times. Actually for me it was I think I had at least six versions not final versions because actually uh, it was more than 10 at the end but six versions in which I was almost rewriting from scratch because there were some very major issues that I need to address and so I was rewriting and every new, new version was almost an entire new application. So seriously, it's a lot of work, it's highly rewarding, but you need to do it. Now, let me be clear about what the positive mindset actually is not. Because a lot of people say like, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I need to be positive. But actually then they start doing a lot of weird things, which is perfectly normal, I did pretty much uh, all these mistakes myself. Uh, <laughs> that's also why I'm really experienced about this. Uh, but the problem is you need to avoid this. So being positive is not about lying or about being misleading. So if you published only one paper, you don't have to write something like I published 10 papers uh, because this would be lying. And also like you don't want to mislead the reader also because in many cases they will be able to figure out that you are uh, trying to sneak your way around. So if you write something like I published a certain number of papers and one is just a number or zero is just a number so technically this sentence is true, um, the readers are not stupid so um, if they figured out is going to be pretty bad for you. You will lose a ton of points. Also, something else that a lot of people do, uh, luckily I didn't do this, but I see a lot of people making this mistake, is that they try to convince the reader that they are amazing, but just with some really empty sentences, like, oh, I'm really good, I'm, I'm outstanding, my uh, amazing CV, and stuff like this. But the problem is, if your CV then it doesn't contain anything outstanding, it's even going to backfire because you're pumping yourself up, you're saying like, oh, I'm amazing. And then they go, they're going to read what you did. And if they don't find anything amazing, it's going to backfire. So it's really important to know how to do this really well. And the trick here is that you actually want to show them that you are a really, good researcher and you might complain here that you are just average so there is nothing so exciting about you and i've been there too so i know exactly the feeling of mm, i'm just normal so uh, how can i show that i'm actually amazing or really good and the trick here is that there are several ways to show that you are good so we are really uh, usually we are forced to think about our achievements only in terms of publications and uh, probably the number of citations but actually there are so many different things that you can highlight that can show that actually you're a really good researcher because maybe you achieved many different things which are interesting and important so for example let's say that you published only one paper if you just write I'm amazing I published only one paper or just I'm amazing because I published one paper uh, no one is going to be impressed. But maybe you can highlight the fact that that paper was published on a very good journal. Maybe it was in Nature or something. Or maybe uh, it got a lot of citation. Maybe that single paper got a lot of attention from the scientific community. Maybe you got invited for writing or for different talks. Or maybe you got invited to the radio. I don't know, you can show that even that single paper that you wrote it's not that huge, but then maybe it got some important consequences that got you to win some prizes or whatever else. Or maybe you don't even want to uh, highlight the paper, you want to highlight something else. So maybe you participated in a lot of conferences. For example, in my CV, something that I highlighted was that I, was, uh, I talked in many international conferences including Tokyo, Paris, and San Francisco. 
So in three different continents. Or maybe you want to discuss the fact that you ranked in the top X of some list. So for example, my university I think was in the top 5% of my country or maybe you were in the top 10% of students of your university. I don't know, there are so many things that you can find that can show that actually you are really good, you are passionate, you can produce a lot of output. But the problem is this is different for each one of us. So really you need to figure out what makes you not just unique, but really what makes you stand out. Another important part is the negative mindset and this would be fundamental for highlighting all the problems of your work. Because if you spend too much time in the positive mindset, you might start thinking that you are amazing, that what you wrote is really fascinating and you don't need many other versions. So maybe you will need just one quick new versions in which you will correct the grammar and that's it. But it's very, very likely that you will need many more versions and so you need to be almost mean to yourself and really highlight all the problems and say like, oh, this needs correction, also this one needs correction, etc. Now, a couple of important things in the negative mindset. Remember that there are several different levels of mistakes or problems. So one problem might be that the grammar is not amazing, it's not the best one. This is definitely one problem. But maybe you also have a second problem, which is that your main claim of your research is very weak or you don't have any proof that this is important. So these are two problems and one is really important. The other one I would leave it for the very last moment. So really make sure that you are able to highlight the most important problems first so you can start addressing them and only later you will move to minor problems. Because if you start addressing everything from the very first moment, it's going to be a nightmare, a disaster, and you will never converge to something which is really, really stable. Also, another important point which uh, I would like to stress is uh, watch out, don't spend too much time in the negative mindset because otherwise you might end up just indulging in self-pity and starting thinking something like um, you're a failure, you will never make it, you're not able to get it, etc. Uh, this, this approach is just useless. So if you find yourself in this state, try to get a break, try to switch to something else, to the positive mindset, whatever, try to get out of there. And again, you need to switch between the two because you will have very many different versions. And as you proceed through the versions, probably you should be able to get into minor problems. So at the very beginning, you will address the major problems. And then the more you go through the versions, the more you can focus on very little problems, such as grammar or whatever else. So tip number two, the right project. And again, you might think that you already have the project and it is partially true but as we will see, most likely is also false. And I want to come back to a discussion that I had with another Marie Curie fellow some times ago, uh, and she was complaining about the fact that only trendy projects get funded. So only projects which focus on a really trendy topic. And uh, I kind of agree with this statement, but also the problem is that the fundings are actually limited. So when the European community decides to give money to a certain project, they are actually choosing to not give money to another project. And this is a huge responsibility because you are choosing which kind of projects are going to survive and what instead is not going to move on. So I think something that they really want to achieve, and actually they are pretty explicit on this, is that in many cases, they want to solve some important social problems. So just to put it very dirty is they're trying to make a better world. And the problem is if your project is doing this, you have to be explicit about this fact. So the reader needs to know 
that your project is going to make the world a better place. And I'm saying this because it happens to me that sometimes I speak to other people uh, about their proposal and uh, I say like, I see your project, but I don't see how this is going to solve any practical problem in the real world. And when I start criticizing them on this, they immediately have like their brain sparks and they're able to tell me like, oh, actually this project is super important because it has this consequence. And if people don't do this, then there would be this other problem, etc. And this is important. If your project falls within this category, you have to be able to put all of this on paper because the reader needs to know that your project is actually solving some important social problems. So let me give you an example about my project and the way I depicted at the very beginning and the way then I depicted at the end, uh, also when it got funded. So in my project, actually, I was going to focus on models of social influence. These are particular type of models. And the problem is in the literature, people use these models only by themselves without using real data. So there is a gap in the literature and we wanted to address this gap. So to bridge uh, the gap between the models and the data. As you see from the literature perspective, this is pretty important. We are solving a problem. But the trick here is that this is a scientific problem, it's not a social problem. So if I put it in this way, maybe some people in the scientific community might be interested, but major funding organizations are not going to be impressed by this because they cannot see the application of something like this. So actually we came up with a version two, uh, which is actually trying to address an important social problem. Very quickly in this version, we start saying that vaccine hesitancy is actually a big social problem. And vaccine hesitancy is the fact that people uh, don't are hesitant to get vaccine. And also this entire project was written and accepted before COVID. So all this problem of vaccine hesitancy was already a big problem some years ago. The second point is that actually we have these models of social influence and these models are developed for modeling this kind of process where people can influence each other and share ideas and how these ideas develop in the community. And we can use them to study something like vaccine hesitancy. The problem here is that even if these models exist, they have never been tested. So there is this lack of connection with the data. So my project then was dedicated to create this connection with the data and then test it on vaccine hesitancy. In this way, our project would be able to shine new light and offer new insights on the problem of vaccine hesitancy possibly leading to a solution and so to increase trust in vaccination. As you can see, both version one and version two solve some problems, but the first version is only solving a scientific problem. Version two is solving both a scientific problem, but then is addressing an important social problem. And this is actually what gets you to the funding. Point number three, the right person that you might think it's me. And that's true, you are going to be funded, but also you have to figure out the right way to present yourself. And here you have to take into account the fact that, yeah, the people are reading your project and maybe they are impressed by your project. It sounds really amazing, really great. But the problem is, are you the right person for this project? And this is a problem because maybe they can read the project, your CV, and think that maybe you're not qualified enough, that maybe another person might be better for this project. So before I told you that some way you have to give the idea that you are a great researcher, actually, I was imprecise. The right point is that you have to show that you're great for this project. You have to show that you are the best person possibly in the world, or at least one of the best person 
for working on this project. In this way, they will really feel like if they give the fundings to you, you will be able to bring this project from the start to the end. And even if there is a problem halfway, because we are researchers, we know there are problems all over the place. If there is a problem, you will be able to find a turnaround and still deliver some results. So how can you do this? Let me show you an example from my background and what I did while I was writing this application. So one problem with my background is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was jumping between subjects. And this actually shows to the reader the fact that I'm some way inconsistent and also the fact that I'm not an expert of anything, especially I was not an expert of vaccine hesitancy or anything related to this project. So why should they fund me? And uh, this was a huge problem. With my supervisor, we spent a lot of time on this and we couldn't find a way around for a long time. And this is also why I'm telling you that you need a lot of work on this. Because many of these problems at the very beginning, they, s they look like you cannot solve them. It's impossible. Uh, the only way to, to show this is bad. Maybe you should neglect all this information. But no, actually in many cases, you can find a way to present yourself and the project in a really good way. But it requires a huge amount of work. So how did we manage to show that I was a very good researcher? And the trick here was that we noticed a certain point that yes, I was jumping around many different fields, but for every project I managed, actually I was able to build both a mathematical model and some simulations that sometimes are also called computational models. So this showed two things. First of all, that I was passionate about modeling. So I was really interested and curious. And since the very beginning, actually, I was always working on modeling techniques. So an entire project about modeling would be not a piece of cake, but at least would be something for me. And second thing was that since I was jumping between fields, actually I was collecting information of modeling techniques of different fields. So I had knowledge of modelings from microfluidics, biophotonics, etc. So I could gather all this knowledge and actually I had a knowledge base that was very unique. And only few people in the world can have a knowledge about modeling that I actually have. And I think this is a really good example on how you can spend tons of hours trying to figure out how to present yourself and your project in a way that is actually interesting and impressive for the reader. And again, none of this is based on misleading information or lying. All of this is true. And it was already true before we wrote it. We just need to figure out that this information was already there. So these are the three main tips and tricks. A very quick fourth one would be to try to work with your team as much as you can and in the best way possible, for example, with your supervisor. Uh, I think we will have a part two anytime soon, uh, but please, ask your questions down in the comments so I can see like what are your questions and I can uh, deliver a part two of this video in which I go more into details like what to write, what to avoid to write, etc. Uh, together with your questions so I can have a more complete video. If you're interested in any of these, consider subscribing, liking, do all the stuff people do on YouTube. And that's it. Thank you very much and see you next time.